Okay, welcome to the second half of our virtual lecture on the requirements for microbial growth. This part we will talk about the chemical requirements. There are five of them, carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, and oxygen. So let's look at each of these individually and what the cells use these for. First, carbon. Carbon is the backbone of all types of organic molecules. These are your sugars or carbohydrates, they're your lipids, uh, your DNA, your RNA, your proteins, every different type of molecule in the cell has carbon as that backbone. Here are some examples. This is a sugar. Every angle here where there's not a letter showing an element, those are all carbons. There are also additional carbon molecules that are bonded off to the side of some of those. This is a sugar. This is an example of an amino acid, part of a protein chain. You can see the backbone of every amino acid follows the same formula with these two carbon molecules in the middle. I'll talk more about proteins in a minute and the other molecules that are there. And this is DNA and it has these two strands. They have a backbone that has sugars in it that has carbon in the sugars. They also, the uh, the middle part, the going across the, of this ladder shape, um, those are also rings of carbon with additional things bond onto those. Um, organisms that are chemoheterotrophs, that's what we do. We have to use organic molecules, those are carbon-based molecules as our energy sources. And even the autotrophs, organisms that can produce their own molecules like plants doing photosynthesis, they have to use carbon dioxide, so it's still a carbon-based molecule. Second, nitrogen. So back to the proteins. The backbone of every amino acid follows the same pattern. NCC stands for nitrogen, carbon, carbon. So every building block of every protein has nitrogen in it. There's also this group here, the letter R, that stands for a variable group. Variable group. So for every amino acid, this part is the same and has the same nitrogen and hydrogens and carbons and oxygen but for each amino acid what's attached to this middle carbon is different so we see more variations here but all of them still have nitrogen um, dna those um, pieces going across the middle those bases are called nitrogenous bases because in those rings with the carbon atoms, there are also a bunch of nitrogen atoms. It's kind of small to see here, but there's nitrogen, 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 nitrogen. Um, ATP, the molecule for energy, the A stands for adenosine. That is based off of this same thing that we find in DNA. In DNA, it's adenine. In ATP, it's adenosine. So it's a small variation on the same molecule. There's still a bunch of nitrogens in it. And you add three phosphates onto the end, and it's ATP. Um, so we find nitrogen in that as well. Most bacteria that are decomposing or breaking down proteins are using it as, a, uh, as their nitrogen source. So they can take that nitrogen out and then rebuild their own proteins from that. Third is sulfur. This um, variable group of proteins that are, that changes from amino acid to amino acid, uh, a bunch of those have sulfur. Here's a couple of examples. So these are chemical formulas written out in a different way. We still see the nitrogen, carbon, carbon backbone. We see those two oxygens on the one end. This is the R group. So in this one, there's a carbon and there's a sulfur right here. Um, this is another amino acid. We see the nitrogen, carbon, carbon backbone. We still see those two big oxygens. And it has on that middle carbon, there's a whole chain of molecules um, and there's a sulfur in that as well. So there's a few amino acids that have sulfur in them. There are also certain vitamins that are used in um, metabolism for different metabolic functions. Those contain sulfur. Some of those contain sulfur as well. So one of the other main things that bacteria get from proteins when they decompose them is they take out sulfur as a um, as a sulfur source so they can put it into the amino acids that they need. Number four, phosphorus. This is another um, big requirement. Um, it's in DNA and RNA. This twisty backbone part of the DNA double helix is alternating sugar and phosphate. So every other molecule here, every other compound is a phosphate that has phosphorus in it. Um, 
So DNA and RNA both have that pattern where every other molecule has phosphorus in it, um, down the whole backbone of the entire strand of DNA and RNA. ATP, adenosine, there's nitrogen and carbon and oxygen and hydrogen here, but it has these three phosphates. Those have phosphorus in them. So we need phosphorus um, for our own ATP. Bacteria have the same molecule for ATP. So bacteria need phosphorus for every single molecule of ATP, powering different reactions and energy in their cells. We also have a plasma membrane made of something called a phospholipid. It's a lipid or a fat molecule with, you guessed it, phosphate on the end of it um, that makes up every single part of a cell membrane. Um, so where do microbes get phosphorus? They can pick it up from water and soils. Phosphate is a normal ion or molecule with a charge that's floating around so they can absorb it from the waters and soils around them and use it, but they could also get it when they decompose other um, organic molecules and use it from that as well. Number five, oxygen. What would microbe need, microbes need oxygen for? Where does oxygen go? What does it do? If you remember in cellular respiration, oxygen is at the end of that electron transport chain. So with no oxygen, the whole process of cellular respiration and ATP production um, shuts down. So different organisms have adapted different ways to live with that. There are the obligate aerobes. Obligate means um, they are required or, or rely on that. Aerobe means um, oxygen. So these organisms require oxygen. Humans are an obligate aerobe. We cannot live without a continuing supply of oxygen so that our cells can continue to make ATP and continue to function. There are many microbes out there that are obligate aerobes. There's also a group called facultative anaerobes. So an anaerobe means you can live without oxygen. Facultative um, means you can do whatever is easiest for you. They can grow um, in the presence of oxygen and do cellular respiration. They can also grow using something called fermentation or anaerobic respiration. So they can switch back and forth. They can make energy with oxygen using the electron transport chain and cellular respiration, or they can make energy without oxygen using other processes um, if oxygen is not available. So they can do either one. Um, there's also some that are obligate anaerobes. Um, anaerobe means without oxygen. Obligate, me, obligate means they're required or they rely on it. So in this case, they are unable to use oxygen at all. Um, and in fact, most of them can be harmed or killed by exposure to oxygen. So let's look at how these different types of microbes would grow in a lab type of setting. So if you grow microbes in a broth down underwater in the, in the broth here in the liquid, there's not very much oxygen there. There's oxygen in the air above it. And in fact, you've actually seen this happen. Um, when you grew some organisms in the different test tubes with the broths in some of our labs a couple weeks ago where you had the swabs and you took environmental samples and you stuck them into a little culture tube with a broth, you actually saw a couple of these patterns. So if it's an obligate arrow, it has to have oxygen um, in order to survive. So they're only going to grow on the surface. So what you see is a little floating film on the surface. They can't survive down here. There's not enough oxygen. They can only grow up near the surface where they can get oxygen from the air. So in a little test tube with the broth, it just looks as this looks like this floating film of bacteria. If something is a facultative anaerobe, that means they can do either one. They can grow with oxygen. They can grow without it. So you would see um, turbidity or that cloudiness here where there's bacteria that are growing in the solution itself. And you would also see a floating film, the ones that are growing, getting oxygen from the air above them. This is a species of bacteria that can do either one. If it's an obligate anaerobe, it has to stay away from oxygen. It cannot survive. It cannot use oxygen. It cannot survive. So it would only be able to grow in the place in the test tube that's furthest away from the oxygen in the air. So it grows as a sediment on the bottom. I know some of the groups, when they checked their little um, 
test tube with the cotton swab, they had a sediment growing on the bottom. That means the species that they had swabbed is an obligate anaerobe. It can only survive far away from oxygen. Um, there were some groups that had a mixture. They had some floating on top. They had um, blurry stuff growing in the water itself. They had some floating in the bottom. That just means it's a mix of species. You had some species that were obligate anaerobes growing on the bottom, some species that could do either, some species that had to grow up at the top to get oxygen from the air. There are a couple of others. Um, if they can tolerate oxygen but don't necessarily need it, you might just get a general cloudiness growing in here. And there's also some groups where they have a requirement for a certain concentration, in which case they'd only survive at some point in the middle of a broth. Too much oxygen and they die, too little oxygen down here, and they would also die. These are pretty rare, um, but they do exist. Most of the things we, we see fall into these three groups um, that I showed you at the beginning.